All right, welcome back to Computer Science E75. My name is David Malin, and this is Lecture 2, PHP Continued. So last week, we sort of set the conceptual foundation for which uh, to start building dynamic websites with PHP. Tonight, we'll dive in a bit more technically. Uh, before we do so, though, a couple of uh, course-related announcements. So sections uh, will begin this evening. Uh, we have uh, slated on the schedule here on the sections page one that will immediately follow, sec uh, immediately follow lectures on Mondays. So those of you who want to minimize commute time can simply stroll literally across the hall to Harvard Hall 103. Uh, we'll replace that TBA now that we know where the room is. And also on Wednesdays, we'll have a section um, in, at 735 in one of the filmed classrooms in Harvard Square at Story Street. So if you click on any of the TF's names here, you'll see exactly when and where those sections are. Uh, those of you who are tuning in from afar know that Wednesday's section will be not only filmed and archived online in video format, it will also be streamed live. So if you'd like to try to participate remotely, it's feasible. What we will likely do is experiment with a few techniques. The teaching fellows might sign in to some, AO, uh, some instant messaging program so that if you'd like to try to answer que ask questions in real time, you can. Um, in my experience in the past, it kind of sort of works. There's about a 30 second delay for buffering purposes, but we'll give it a shot. It's at least another option. And then finally, on Thursdays, Chris Power, one of the courses teaching fellows, who you'll likely not meet until the computer science fair at Courses End, uh, because he lives in Philadelphia, is one of our online TFs. And he will be leading an online section using that software called Illuminate in the virtual terminal room that I mentioned last week. Uh, so on Thursday night, if you'd like to partake really in an interactive chat session whereby Chris will use VoIP technology to lead the section verbally, but also interact via chat room interfaces and also show slides and examples on the screen, do check that out, if only be, uh, especially if you've never uh, partake, uh, partaken in something like that. And that, too, will be recorded and made available online. All of this on the sections page. So for instance, tonight, and if you stick around for tonight's section, uh, we have handouts that are already linked here in PDF format, much like we do for lectures. And similarly, will we hold ad hoc office hours throughout the week, especially when projects start to ramp up so that you have, if you have questions that really are best answered one-on-one, -on -one, we'll have that as well, both online and locally. I think that's it for the high-level overview of logistics. Any questions? No? I'm told the Coop should have most, if not all, of our recommended books, incidentally. If you like to window shop and would like to check out those books, just to see if you'd like to then go buy them online elsewhere, um, know that those are available across the street now, I am told. All right, so PHP is an interpreted language, a scripting language. And it's a language that you can commingle with HTML or XHTML. And we saw this briefly last week. Tonight, we're going to actually dive in a little deeper and start building some more interesting uh, pieces of code. So the means by which we'll likely do this in terms of actually getting user input is by way of forms. Right? We saw this in the context of our fake Google website last time. And you might have noticed on the courses website, we have this little form interface. It's not terribly fancy, and arguably it's not even that useful, because it doesn't do anything that you can't already do with Google or by visiting any of these websites directly. But it does kind of illustrate at least some of these same building blocks. We thought it would be neat, really, just because we could do this, to allow you to uh, click in that search field and then click any of those four buttons to search either Apache's manual for the web server software, MySQL's manual for the database manual, uh, PHP's, and then also YUI, the CSS and JavaScript library that we'll allude to throughout the course. And so simply, if you go over here and type in something like hmm, that count function, by default, if you hit Enter, it's going to whisk you away to what we assume is going to be the most popular desire, uh, PHP.net. But if you actually click on these buttons and are actually searching for something like, hmm, what are those rewrite rules that we talked about last week with regard to Apache? Well, apparently, it will then go and search Apache's documentation. So just to illustrate how this is working, and we'll come, we'll loop back on this later in the semester when we actually look at JavaScript. If I scroll through all of this mess and go down to the bottom, this is all implemented by way of this relatively short form here. So let me go ahead and zoom in on part of this here. And that will show us a few things that uh, are reminiscent, perhaps, from last week. So one, action, just quick uh, softball review. Action, uh, the, that attribute does what for you in a form? The URL submitted. Right, the URL that it gets submitted to, method, equals quote unquote something. What does that do for us? Sorry? To get the input, but uh, the method attribute allows you to specify what two values? 
Yeah, or so get or post, at least so far as we saw last week.、Uh, interesting thing about get is what, would you say? Yeah, I'm going to take the aggregate answer here. Yes, so the answer,、um, what is submitted in that form appears then in the URL, which is actually useful for what purposes? So, bookmarking, it allows you to maintain state in the URL, which is an underappreciated feature. In fact, I was just,、uh, the department will remain nameless, but just today, the TFs and I were trying to poke around at a website within Harvard that、uh, recently overhauled itself, such that now no longer is state maintained in the URLs, which means if you want to email a fellow teaching fellow a, this page that you're now looking at, you can't. And it's for this stupid, simple reason. Post, meanwhile, Um, allows you to get by what restrictions? Yeah, so size, right? So there's no official maximum length on URLs, but it's generally agreed that、uh, you're pushing the limits if you're trying to store more than, say, 1024 characters in a URL string, because different browsers have different buffer sizes. And certainly when it comes to uploading files or any large amounts of data, it's just not going to fit in the URL. Plus, you get that nuisance of pasting URLs into emails, and then you send them away, and then you get that. Sort of non technical friend who replies saying the URL doesn't work because they don't realize that it's simply wrapped onto multiple lines. So, stupid things like this, but POST allows us to avoid things like that and solve yet other problems. It looks like we, in this case, and there's a bit of distraction here, are using GET. Now, why that is, we'll perhaps defer for a moment, but if I scroll over to the right, I also have the name of this form for some reason, which may or may not be useful. But let's ignore again for the moment all of these divs and these style attributes, which are simply aesthetic details. Notice that there's an input here of name Q. And then there's some stylization because it just, was just easier for us to embed everything in this one file so that we could look at it all at once. So there's just that text field. And then there's a few different buttons. So if I zoom in now on these buttons, which is another input type, notice that. I don't actually have them as type equals, sorry. I think in retrospect we'll remove the CSS so that this is a little more readable. I'm scrolling all the way over to the right, and notice over here that the type of these other inputs, the YUI button and the Apache button and the MySQL button, are all of type button. And we're actually not using them really as part of form submission, but we're rather hijacking their clickability and using a snippet of JavaScript. So we'll see later in the semester when we focus on some neat JavaScript tricks that there's a whole bunch of event handlers that you can. Register, so to speak. And one of them is this handler called onClick. In other words, as it kind of、uh, conjures up,、uh, on clicking this button, the following should happen. Well, what is the following? It's anything that's actually in quotes there. And even if you've never seen JavaScript before or understood JavaScript before, it's fairly readable. Apparently, on clicking this first button, and I'm looking, just to be clear, unfortunately I can't highlight and zoom at the same time, I'm looking at this first input here. Input、uh, on click window location. So, what I'm going to do here is just parse this visually. So, on click, the windows.location is going to now equal http www google.com slash search. We saw that last week. And then a few different parameters, some of which we didn't see last week. And it's a little cryptic for now, but that's fine. But notice the very last line of this actually has us appending this thing. And herein lies a quick explanation of why I gave the form a name. So, for now, just take away that you can describe the document of a web page as quote unquote document. It is what we'll see a, a member of a DOM, a document object model. But in that document, there's apparently some element, a form element, in fact, that has the name of search. So, document.search now starts at the top of this document conceptually, zooms in down to that form. Q was what? Yeah, so the name of the input that we presumably gave to just conjure up the notion of query, and the query's value, so q.value, is apparently being concatenated with that plus operator to essentially that long, cryptic looking Google URL. So the effect of this ultimately is to say, on clicking this button, change the document.location, the Windows location. To be the following URL, where some of that URL is hard coded and the other part obviously is dynamically inserted. And so we can see this. If we use that same button that's searching the Apache manual and I simply type in foobar here and click Apache, notice that in fact the URL does change to be precisely what we predicted it would.、Uh, little trivia if I simply type foobar and hit enter, which of those buttons actually gets executed? Okay, none. PHP, Apache, 
we wait long enough, we'll get all four, right? And then no one will feel left out. What's that? Either none or the first one. All right, well, let's see. So I did do this before. So the answer is, in fact, it appears PHP, even though that is the third button. So why might that be? If I go back to the source code of this page, let me search for that form element, scroll down just a little bit. Can one hypothesize why, in fact, PHP appears to be the default? Sorry? It's caching the event in. Not quite. It's even more simple than that, the explanation. It's just the action, right? So the default behavior of this form upon clicking any of these, uh, upon hitting enter, is to submit a form, right? When you go to Google, most of you probably just hit enter. When you go to Yahoo, you just hit enter. You probably don't click the Google search button or the go button or whatnot, but you can. But by default, when you simply hit enter in any web form, the implied behavior is submit this form. Well, we said last week and this, in this, early this evening that the default behavior for a form is to submit to the value of the action action attribute. And because I arbitrarily, if not conveniently, decided that the action of this form is just going to be us.php.net slash results.php, that's all. I have not used any JavaScript there. It's just that the default case is to submit the form as usual. Using get, and now we can come full circle to that question, why would you propose, why do you think I chose method equals get for this form as opposed to post? So I'm appending the URL, at least in the JavaScript cases. What about the default PHP case, where I am explicitly using method equals quote unquote get? Right, so we saw last week that Google doesn't support post, and maybe PHP.net doesn't either. Well, we can certainly figure this out by trial and error, but it certainly is possible to confirm that they support post, or get rather, by just going, for instance, to PHP.net. I'll go to the manual here. And notice at some point I probably went to this same search box. I typed in foobar and hit enter just so I could see what happens. And sure enough, I saw something similar to this. And I think I adopted a slightly different URL. I think it's results.php. Uh, I must have chosen a slightly different option here. Let's see. All php.net's online documentation. Foobar. See if I can recreate what I did. Yep, there it is. So I chose search all the documentation, and I just looked. I infer, I sort of reverse engineered their search engine, so to speak. But even that's kind of an overstatement. And I see that the URL up there is uh, us3.php.net and results.php question mark, which denotes here come the parameters, and then Q equals such and such. And apparently I just stripped off um, some of that stuff thinking eh, it's not even that necessary. And apparently it's not. Maybe post would work, maybe it wouldn't. The point is I just wanted to figure out how to replicate this behavior. Now to your point earlier about JavaScript where I was inserting the URLs via window.location, again a trick we'll come back to later in the course, is that implicitly using get or post? Sorry? It is, in fact, using get. So any time you're sending the user from point A to B just by way of a URL or by modifying what's in the location bar but by a JavaScript or a physical a click on their part, it's just using get. So that is uh, perhaps a reinforcement of what we began to touch on last week. Yeah? So what happens if you use this? Are they going to regret a method other than get or post. So there are a few others. You can, for instance, specify a method of head, which means just give me the headers back. Um, it, long story short, it depends on the web server, what it's designed to reply to. And typically, you would do this in the web server's configuration file. So in fact, last week when we looked at httpd.conf, or little snippets thereof, it's in a file like that that you can actually specify. You can, quote unquote, limit requests to uh, one of several different methods. By default, get and post really are the only ones that, say, a developer writing code at this level would even need to worry, worry about. But head is useful when you're trying to implement monitors, when it comes to load balancing, and, and other such tricks. Incidentally, uh, it's, tough to it's tough to conclude with certainty. But if you take a look up at where we ended up a moment ago, uh, US3, this is sort of a possible example of uh, poor man's load balancing, where you physically send the user to a hard-coded name like us1.php.net or p uh, us2.php.net or us 
here in this case, 3.php.net. Presumably, they've got at least three web servers, just an inference here. But what's perhaps a downside if, in fact, I'm being uh, fairly critical of them here of using this scheme? Like, I typed in php.net, and apparently I got routed to this site instead. Right, so if us3.php.net goes down, whatever web server represents it, kind of defeats the point of maintaining high availability and keeping your website up and running. And there's certainly other websites that do this. And just keep an eye out, perhaps henceforth in the URL, and see which sites are perhaps using this simple and easy, but perhaps short-sighted approach to balancing load across their several servers. So you had a little bit of unofficial homework last week, which was to find, uh, a week ago, a website that apparently doesn't quite work if you don't type in the dub dub dub, and we found one very close to home. And last week's unofficial homework was to explain why. Did anyone come up with the reason? Okay, out of 156 students, only those who aren't here are off the hook. Did anyone actually do this? I did, lest I be uh, embarrassed by not having done it. Wow, okay, so here's what. <laughs> you could have done in about five seconds. So if you pull up a typical command line in a Unix environment, Linux environment, even a Mac OS or probably Windows, there's a few different tools that you have at your disposal, a couple, one of which I think I played with a couple weeks ago. Um, a first approach would be to use nslookup and look up something like www.harvard.edu, enter, and hopefully we'll get back a response. And in fact, we do. Apparently, this is the DNS server that my machine just contacted, so not that interesting, at least right now. A non-authoritative answer comes back as follows. www.harvard.edu's canonical name is apparently this. So that kind of suggests that a, a canonical name is a, a, a C name. So a C name record is in use here that's mapping one to the other. And the real name of this server is, in fact, this thing for whatever historical reasons, and its IP address is this. Why is this a non-authoritative answer, would you conjecture? Yeah, it's cached, right? So I'm not getting this answer from the source, probably ns1.harvard.edu, but from whoever owns 209.50.225.11, which is maybe just some other group on campus, but not the true authority of this address. Well, that's kind of interesting. Let's now go to harvard.edu. OK, so that's interesting. Now, this doesn't always mean there's no DNS entry. Frankly, this often means your router's not behaving properly or your machine's not behaving properly. So it's good, generally, I would say, just from experience, to poke around a little harder. But the immediate reaction is harvard.edu doesn't exist, right? at least so far as DNS is concerned. Well, another neat command is dig. So dig uh, harvard. Uh, let's do www.harvard.edu. This one's a little more technical because it apparently dumps out what for you? Yeah, so the actual zone file, so to speak, the lower level DNS config information that we looked at a little bit last week. And it looks like up top there that as NSLOOKUP, it kind of dumbed it down, but in a useful way, harvard.edu apparently is a C name for this thing. So that much was clear a moment ago. And in turn, this thing it has an A record of this IP address. So that's pretty familiar now. And you could replicate the same idea using your panel or using your own box that's running a, a name server. Let's dig a little deeper now. So now I'm going to get rid of the dub 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 and see what I get back. Enter. So that's the problem. At least that's one of the problems, right? What is missing, apparently? <laughs> This is your problem right here, right? There's nothing there, apparently. Now, I say this is at least one problem. So if we went ahead and fixed this, which I do not have the ability to do, I can simply bring it up, apparently, every semester. It's actually a wonderful pedagogical example, so I hope they never fix it. Um, so we could go ahead and insert a value there of an actual IP address, presumably the same IP address as the dub 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 version. So they all go to the same place. But uh, hypothesize what else could be a problem. That might not be enough to fix this this challenge. What else could be wrong after that? Yeah, so the web server itself, whether it's Apache or IIS, might not serve up content if it sees that the host field coming in on the request 
is harvard.edu instead of www.harvard.edu. So you may recall that in the snippets of the httpd.conf file that I showed last week, you specify a server name and zero or more server aliases. Well, if there is no alias or no server name for harvard.edu, but only for www.harvard.edu, DNS might get the request to the web server, but then you might get an answer like, mm, no website here. The website will respond, but it might serve up an error message as opposed to the actual content. So your third unofficial homework assignment, and I think I'm talking on to deaf ears here. You write it down. Does it matter? Apparently not. So is to simulate this request so that if you go ahead in your browser, figure out how to type HTTP colon slash slash harvard.edu, enter, have your computer somehow trick itself into making the request of the right IP address so that you can figure out what the behavior will be by the endpoint, the actual web server. In other words, you can trick your computer via some means, Google is your friend, into knowing what the IP address should be of harvard.edu, even though none of us in this room have the ability to go change the DNS servers. So, so, <laughs> so you, you look pensive, but let's see if you can back this up. You have two weeks, actually. Next Monday's a holiday, so there's really no excuse. You have two extra hours in which to tackle this problem. So let's now begin to do something with PHP. And let me make a, a mention of regular expressions. Just by a quick show of hands, those of you coming into the course already with some familiarity with regular expressions? OK, so most folks, even if not, these are not terribly hard once you get the hang of at least the basics, and they're wonderfully powerful, arguably expensive computationally, at least if you're a little naive with implementing them. But in a nutshell, a regular expression is a series of characters, just a string, that you can type out with which to do pattern matching. And this is an incredibly useful tool because it allows you to validate data inputted by users. For instance, what's a piece of data you might want to constantly validate before doing something with it? So uh, an FAS username, perhaps, maybe even more specifically? Uh, sorry? Also a password. When trying to make a user choose a good password, you might want to check that it actually has certain characteristics. What else? Has structure that you might want to pattern match. So email address, perfect example. Anytime you register for a website, if the website's a little smart, it's going to do some sanity checking and make sure you're not just inputting your first name. Uh, in fact, I will poke a little fun. SurveyMonkey that we used for Project Zero Survey, unfortunately, doesn't really let us validate data. So we got people's home addresses for email addresses. We got entire English sentences sometimes for phone numbers and things like this. Um, it's very frustrating because then I was the regular expression parser manually fixing all of this data, which is to say this is wonderful. When you actually have the ability to code your own forms and code your own validators, these are some building blocks that henceforth in the course, and frankly, after the course and in a lot of other languages, are wonderfully useful. So PHP made a very helpful decision to support pretty much all of the regular expression features that Perl already supports. And Perls have kind of become adopted, and even those were stolen from other implementations in Spirit, um, have stolen these same features. So just to give you a hint of this, um, if you are trying to check if an email address is, actually, let's see, if a, um, let's say, a, uh, a username is valid, an SVS username, let's say for simplicity, can only contain uh, alphabetical characters. It can actually contain numbers, but we'll stick to alphabetical characters. So suppose you have a form that a user has filled out and they've typed in Malin as their username. Now on the server side, you want to do some sanity checking. Is Malin a syntactically valid username? Forget about checking a database to see if it even exists. Is it syntactically possible? And this, again, would have been nice in SurveyMonkey if we could do a little bit of sanity checking. So I want to check if M-A-L-A-N is actually a legitimate username. Well, we can uh, pattern match this against a regular expression. And as this little chart implies, we could simply check if username equals equals quote unquote mailin. Well, that's certainly a sufficient test, at least for this, but it doesn't scale, right? So we need to be a little more generic. So the string that we could use to check if another string is a valid username has got to conjure up the idea of something alphabetical. And the most explicit way to do this would be something like this. In brackets, this is what's called a character class. You can actually enumerate all of the characters that are allowed. Now, it would be a little annoying if I had to type in A through Z in both uppercase and lowercase even, just to tolerate some case, uh, case differences. But there are some little tricks. So for instance, if you write A hyphen Z, 
And then also, just to avoid people who might have had their caps lock key on by accident, literally A hyphen Z, big A hyphen big Z, that will say give me any character that's in this class. But now I kind of need to do this at least once, then twice, three, five times at least, up to say eight times. Well, what's the simplest, perhaps dumbest way to do this? Well, that's actually pretty smart, I would say. That's smarter than my dumb way. Of, yes, copy this seven more times, right? So it's this, 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 it would work, right? If we assume this is the basic building block. There are some other tricks, though. Plus means one or more instances of what just came before this. So that already suggests that it's the right approach. Um, star, which you might be more familiar with, means not one or more, but zero or more, kind of problematic for usernames, which presumably should at least exist with one or more characters. And then there's other tricks like this, where you can use curly braces and actually say how many instances of the previous thing do you actually want. Now, we're just scratching the surface of these things. But here on this slide alone, do you see really some of the basic building blocks that start very small. And you can start to do more and more sophisticated things. And we'll perhaps try that with an actual PHP example. Because there are functions in PHP that let you ask, is this string comparable to this string? And it will do the uh, expression matching for you. If you have ever taken a course in uh, theory of computation, if you know what a DFA, deterministic finite automaton, these kinds of things are, well, that's generally how a regular expression parser is implemented. If you're finally wondering why you took that course, it does actually come into play. So treat this as reference for now, but we'll actually do something now with it. So a dynamic website of sorts. So we thought we'd take a look under the hood of our own website, if only because you're going to be clicking on it a lot. And it's perhaps enlightening just to see, ah, that's how they implemented this particular page. Now, the TFs and I um, certainly like to do as little work as possible when it's boring. And updating a website by adding a new link is not the most interesting process of the in the world, certainly if it's just copy and paste every week because there's some common structure to the website. And so we actually decided long ago to factor out all of the data in the website to an XML file. And we'll spend um, the next two lectures talking about XML and the PHP support for it. But you can kind of infer from this snippet of XML, even if you've never seen XML before, there's clearly some structure to this thing. It's clearly referencing files that are presumably now on the website. And so all we actually have to do week to week is just very quickly tweak this file. And all of the HTML, XHTML that we want to generate is based off of this file. We never go in and edit manual um, file. So it's a nice separation of content versus presentation. And it's a lot easier to edit this and then even overhaul the aesthetics of the website without the actual data ever changing. So let's just take a look, for instance, at our home page. We've done, spent a while trying to factor out some common code. And you'll see that this is pretty much all that represents the course's home page. So the home page is certainly a little more complicated than this one image would imply. So the home page is this thing here. There's kind of a lot going on there. But if you look here, there's pretty much only some textual content and minimal markup, some divs and it seems some function calls. And therein lies some of the magic that we'll start to scratch the surface of today. So if I scroll down here, that's it. Really, the, mo the guts of this page are just text. That's actually it. What do you not see? What tags that should be in any web page? There's no HTML tag. There's no body tag. There's no head tag. There's no closing of any of those tags. So it's actually been factored out. So a very common paradigm in the PHP world, and even in uh, ASP or CGI, is to at least try to factor out common components of your website so that you edit fairly minimal files. In fact, almost all of the pages on our website are just called index.html. And they live in their own subdirectories, just because we wanted to have things nicely compartmentalized. And we could have been fancier, but that's nice and simple. It may keep, kept us sane. But every one of those files contains at least this line up here. So a very common paradigm in PHP is to use this function called require, or require once, or include. So these are all pretty similar with subtle differences. But as this name alone implies, this means require the following file. And if you're coming from any language that allows you to include one file in another, this is pretty much telling the web server, go find this file, grab its contents, paste them here, 
and then execute this whole file. So it's actually including the file there. And then that second line of code is doing something a little fancier than we'll start off in the course, but it's apparently calling a function called course. And then by way of this arrow operator, is calling a member method called header. And even though you might not have seen syntax like this before, the, the takeaway is that there's a function somewhere called header, and it's associated something with the course. And so this function probably spits out what? Yeah, so all that stuff that we said was missing from this page, the HTML tag, the body tag, the head tag, the title tag, all of that stuff that pretty much stays constant page by page, at least if you choose to design your website following some similar structure. Well, let's see if we can't, um, to the detriment of anyone trying to use it at the moment, break the home page by deleting that one function call, reloading here, and yes, kind of important, the stuff at the top of a web page, it would seem. All right, what if we remove the stuff at the bottom instead? Get rid of the footer, which closes the HTML tag, closes the body tag, and that stuff at the bottom. Well, let's reload now. OK, so now we kind of lost the whole right-hand side of the web page, everything toward the bottom. So it's pretty dramatic. Well, what's actually in these functions? Well, just to give you a taste of this, and we'll ultimately link these files online, and you have printouts of some of tonight's examples, I'm going to go into the lib directory and the course directory, because we tried to be a bit anal where we were putting things. But this is the file, course.php. And just to give you a sense of after iteration and if after iteration, sort of how um, modular your code can become, even in this language PHP. Let me go ahead and search for the footer function. And apparently, I'm just doing this. So I've required this file called templates slash footer.php. And then just to be extra anal, I'm closing our database connection, even though that's not strictly necessary. All right, so now we can kind of follow the breadcrumbs here. What's in templates slash footer.php? Well, you can probably guess. So in templates slash footer.php, oh. It's just a bunch of boring code that we factored out because it didn't really need to be in every little file. In fact, here's how we include our little Google Analytics script so we can get nice statistics on the website. We include it in every page by just putting it in a file that in turn is included in every page. So if you've ever used server-side includes, SSIs, you can do the same trick. Uh, if you've ever used other scripting languages, you can do the same trick. But it's a very common approach in PHP to take some header and factor it out, take some footer, factor it out, and plop it generally in its own file. Or you could even just use a lot of printf statements to just print this and this and this and this. So you'll see many different ways um, in this course and in PHP in general. So any questions just yet? No? OK. So let's actually write something rather than rely on what the course already has there. So I'm going to go ahead into our lectures directory here, uh, go into to, our, whoops, uh, to source, and let's go ahead and do the following. OK, we did Google last week, so let's take a look at this. OK, so this is a real world example insofar as I actually had to solve this problem years ago as a student when we, um, so when I arrived at college, there were freshman intramural sports, casually called Frosh IMs. And back in the day, and sadly, this wasn't all that long ago, I used to sign up for these sports, whether it's uh, hockey or tennis or whatever, by filling out a piece of paper, walking halfway across campus, sliding it under the door of the RA who was running freshman intramural sports, and then they would like manually process all this stuff. So it was very low-hanging fruit in like 1995 for anyone with programming skills or without programming skills skills to acquire them and solve this problem. And so literally, one of the first things I ever did with, it, with Perl, not PHP back then, was to implement something reminiscent of this. And in fact, it was probably even uglier at the time. But we needed to ask people their name, their gender, and where they lived, and whether or not they were going to be the captain of this sport, and maybe some other information as well. So this is a very simple form that certainly you could whip up now, having seen some of the basics from last week. And it's just a very simple. HTML form that could be implemented in any number of ways. And I took the perhaps blasphemous approach of uh, laying it out with a table. And we'll see approaches to avoid tables altogether. But for now, it keeps it very simple. And if you've not seen this approach before, just to give you a taste of why I would argue this is certainly useful when just learning this stuff, it's very easy to make a grid like that and lay things out very pretty. Uh, even to this day, it's a, it's a headache getting this to work properly in CSS across all browsers. But that's it. So I fill out this form, I click register. Where does the data have to go? Last week I kind of cheated and sent all my data to Google. 
So it's got to go to a database, a file, right? If you don't have access to a database, much like you'll be forced not to have for project one, well, you could write it to a text file, like a CSV file, comma separated values, just a plain ASCII file, .txt, an XML file, as we'll see. Well, for now, let's at least try to get the data somewhere. Well, if I take a look at the source code, it looks like I decided in advance that this thing is going to go to register.php, and it's going to use post just because for now. All right, well, let's see if we can't send that somewhere. Let me hide, do the, uh, hide the cake that has been pre-made here uh, by creating this file, register.php. So any PHP file that's actually going to do something has to start with these PHP directives so that the web server knows, aha, not only is this a PHP file, here is a chunk of code that I actually need to interpret and thus convert to something other than PHP. So nothing between these two uh, brackets actually appears in the browser. They get executed server side. Now I can be really lame when starting out here and just say something like, uh, hello world, just as a sanity check, frankly, just to make sure this thing is working. So if I now go to this page, click register, what URL am I going to hit? So register.php, and it's going to, the browser is going to assume that file is in the same directory as this HTML file, as is the case anytime you have relative links. So I click register. OK. So the form maybe works, but at least now I know that I have my framework up and running. All right, so print hello world is kind of lame. Let's actually do something with the information. Well, what can we do? Well, you know what? I'd like to see what I actually am submitting. So I'm going to use this um, rarely used tag, preformatted text, just because it's useful. And remember this little debugging trick. So we print recursively the following. Well, where is the data from a form going to be stored, did we say? Yeah, so a super global, one of these global variables that's automatically provided by the mere fact you're running PHP in a web server environment. And there were a few options. We had at least yeah, get, post, and then request. And sort of good practices would say don't kind of cut corners and just use request. At least choose get or post. So in this case, I should probably use, yeah, so dollar sign underscore post. And now, that's it for now. This is not a valid web page. Really, I'm just kind of learning. I'm building up. So I'm going to type in my name, David. I shall be Captain Mail and Matthews. And now register. And so here we begin to see the, the abilities that we get really out of the box. And frankly, doing something as trivial as this used to be kind of a headache with Perl. You would need to install another library, the CGI PM library, or jump through hoops just to get at the data that was being submitted. PHP really lowers this bar. So before we actually go and do something with this data, let me pause and introduce um, one of our uh, newest team members right over here. Jennifer, do you want to come up and just say a quick hello? The bar is very low as to how good a speech you need to give so far. Hi, I'm Jennifer Rogers. I'm currently a freshman here. I took CS50 last semester, and I've been programming for several years now. So hopefully I'll get to see you in section or in office hours. I think that was the best speech yet so far. <laughs> and I think Sid has, oh, yeah, wow. No one has gotten applause yet. And Sid, if you could come up and say a quick hello into my microphone. Hi, um, hi I'm Sid. I'm Sid Hart. If Sid is easier to go by, Sid works. I'm a freshman. I took CS50 with Jen with uh, David last term. I'm really excited to be here. All right, so Sid will actually be leading our first section tonight right across the hall, Harvard Hall 103, and we'll be rotating week to week as to who is uh, leading the week section. So thank you to both of you. So um, having now reached 156 students, there's now nine of us on staff instead of the original three that you met on the first day. So we are now fully staffed and ready for your questions. And in fact, if you have not already done so, do um, take notice of the bulletin board that's now on the course's website. If you log in, you'll see an interface a little like this. And you will get the account with which to log in by way of Project Zero survey. So once that's submitted, within 72 hours, you'll get back an automated email with your domain information, username, password that will let you into the course's website and into the panel and all of that. And you'll see that there's already been a number of posts, so nine posts related to Project Zero, 14 other posts, a couple of announcements. So do keep track of the bulletin board or subscribe to the RSS feeds if you would like, uh, just to stay abreast of what's going on. And certainly with so many students, many of whom are online, please feel that this is one of the best windows into the course and means of reaching out both to staff and each other, especially with configuration questions and the like. So with that said, um, notice one thing, which is a convention worth noting. The value of that checkbox, making me captain, apparently returned a value of 
on by default. So bear that in mind there. And there's also some neat tricks here with PHP. Just to give you some basic building blocks, let me actually go into froshims.html. And you've probably seen on many websites the ability to select not one, but multiple options. So if I change this select menu to be a size of not one, but let's say uh, 10, and reload this page, I can now see multiple things at once. Minor aesthetic detail, because I have a blank one there. So let me get rid of that blank option. So now I can click on things without having to uh, pull up a drop down. But even by holding control, I'm not selecting multiple ones. So I can do this. So select, uh, in back in the day in HTML, you just say this. Unfortunately, this is not valid XHTML. You instead have to give every attribute a value if you're coming from the world of HTML. And just because this seemed no worse than any other approach, the approach to take when taking an attribute that used to just stand atomically is to say foo equals quote unquote foo. So weird as this looks, this is the proper way to do it. Reload this. And now with control, I can select multiple options. If I go ahead and register now, notice I've selected, what, uh, five of them. Hmm, a bug, I would say. So anyone know how I can fix this bug so that multiple things not only get clicked, but actually get submitted? Yeah, so in the name, very simple fix. Rather than saying this is a dorm, you need to tell PHP to expect multiple values. And you very simply do that by using a couple of empty square brackets right next to each other. Now if I reload the whole page and reselect, say, these several items and click register, notice what's really powerful here. Print recursive is showing you the true structure. So what you'll get back in the variable called dorm is actually itself an array that's zero indexed, which is really nice. You get this kind of stuff for free out of the box. So now let's actually do something with this data. Um, let's suppose that I need to make sure that uh, the person's name is only alphabetical. Right? So we'll sort of borrow this idea here. So how can I go about doing this? Well, let me go back to register.php. And now I'm going to have to do, I want to do the following. I want to print out a web page that simply says, yes, you have registered, or no, I'm going to reject your input for some reason. So just a yes or no answer. And I'm not going to worry about copying all of the annoying XHTML transitional headers. We're just going to keep it simple for now to focus on the, the essence of the problem. So how do I do this? Well, I need to check several fields. So I can do this in a number of ways. I can very simply or intuitively say if the value of post, quote unquote, let's say name, let's take a very simple pass at this first, equals equals nothing. Well, then what do I want to do? I can simply say print, uh, you must provide your name. And I can just leave it at that. All right, I can also then do something similar. I'm just going to do a little copy paste here. What about their captain? I don't really need to validate the captain. It's either there or not. I'm not going to require it, so let me ignore that. Gender, I kind of want them to click, so how can I check this? So I could very simply do something like this, because if gender is not provided at all, it's not going to get back a value, most likely. So let's see what happens now. Very simple program, certainly not the prettiest of sites, but let's see if it gets the job partly done. Let me reload this just to go back to our original version. All right, so I'll type in David, I'll be captain, and I'll be male, and I will choose one dorm and register. OK, nothing happened, but actually that was a good thing. So we could do this now just to make these mutually exclusive. Else, uh, welcome to the team. OK, let's resubmit, reload. OK, so that seemed to work. Now let's get a little smarter about this. All right, So I actually want to require that the name is not only there, but I also want to ensure that it matches some regular expression. So I don't want to just check if it's not there. Why don't I do something like this? So if it's not the case that that string matches the following Perl regular expression, sort of reading the function in reverse. So it, this function, pregmatch, takes two arguments. One, a regular expression. And two, the value that you want to compare against that regex. And then you need to uh, an alphabetical name. So now I just have to fill in the blank here. And the convention in pregmatch is to put on the left-hand side and right-hand side of your regular expression two slashes. You can use other tokens, but two slashes is uh, the default, the convention. Inside of this, I now have to do an actual string. Well, let me kind of be tricky here 
and say, if your name is not David, let's provide a non-David name. All right, just to demonstrate that this appears to actually be working. All right, let's go ahead and submit this. Whoops. If preg match not equals David, you must provide a non-David name. Uh -huh. Oh, right. Yes. Wait a minute. If it not, oh, I, you, okay, there we go. Fix the bug by changing the message. Oh, wait a minute. Yes. Okay. David, not so smart. Okay. <laughs> Joe, <laughs> this is why we normally prefab the demos. Okay, so you must provide a David name. All right, in the future, we'll also come up with more creative examples. Okay, so it appears to be working because it's not the case that the following string, post bracket name, equals David because clearly it equaled Joe. But when I was sort of uh, stupidly typing my own name, it was working just fine because that did in fact match David. Unfortunately, if I want to require that David is the only string that's allowed, I have to actually be a little more stringent. If I type in David now, we determine that this is actually okay. But I actually want to allow, for instance, that to go through, at least now that does allow this to go through. But I kind of want to enforce that only David appears. Well, there's a problem. Because David appears between these two slash marks here, it just means that it has to appear where? So anywhere. There can be anything to the left and there can be anything to the right. So another trick you'll see on that cheat sheet is that if you want to specify that the regular expression has to start matching at the start of the string and then at the end of the string, all the way to the end of the string, caret symbol means start matching at the front, dollar sign means start a stop ending at the back. And that means literally the string has to be everything between these two characters. So this is now equivalent to saying if post name not equals quote unquote David. So it's sort of underutilizing the power of regular expressions, but we can now sort of again integrate these building blocks. And if I want to do now this approach here, I can say something like this. If it's not the case that the whole string equals something from, let's say, a to z and a to z, go ahead with the plus symbol and say you must provide an alphabetical name. So if it's not the case that post name matches this, yell at the user. So if they type anything other than those characters. Well, let's try this. So let's go ahead and first type in just David and click register. OK, welcome to the team. Well, what if I instead type David? with a few exclamation points. OK, problematic because it's not matching what's actually in that character class. If I actually wanted to tolerate that, well, just start enumerating. And you'll see in that cheat sheet, as well as in any number of tutorials, that there are also some um, common conventions. For instance, backslash w represents what's called a word character. So that's generally something that's alphabetical. And I think underscores are typically included as well. Backslash s denotes any type of white space, whether it's the space key, the tab character, the enter key, and a whole bunch of others. So you don't have to enumerate in character classes anything. There are certainly some tricks out there that will make this much easier. So we'll leave it as a first prop project one exercise to determine how to validate an email address. But there's some interesting aspects there, like the at sign and the dot. And God forbid you have to somehow validate all the possible TLDs. We won't expect as much. But there's certainly some sanity checks. And in fact, some websites you'll find even out there are more stringent than they should be. So reading the RFC that defines an email address, the official spec for it, is kind of a nightmare. It's, it's nothing short of unclear reading this thing. But some people have certainly simplified what it means to be an email address, reasonably so. Most of you in this room probably know it's got to have, what, alphabetical characters. Numbers are OK. Hyphens are OK. What else? Dots are OK. Underscores are, spe but how about pluses? So pluses are OK. So pluses, so, and it's people like you, if I can pick on, that have made websites where you can't type in certain email addresses. So a bit of a technical aside, but suggestive of what regular expressions gone awry do sometimes, it is valid on many email servers actually to say something like this, mailing at foo at, say, harvard.edu. So this should actually be allowed by some web servers, and as a convenience, 
I think even Gmail might support this feature, but don't quote me on that. They, uh, it might once have supported this feature. The idea of this email syntax or structure is that this, anything sent to this address should actually go to mailin at harvard.edu, but everything in the whole string should be preserved because this is actually useful if you're really a geek for what purposes? Telling people that your email address is username plus whatever at domain name.tld. Yeah, so spam. And I actually used to do this on various websites. If I wanted to make sure that I could filter my email effectively, and I knew that if I go to 1-800-flowers.com, right? It's Valentine's season, and I needed to order some flowers, and I really don't want to end up on their annoying spam list. Well, I could register as mailin plus flowers at harvard.edu. And then ideally, that email address, that email, any email sent to that address should still go to mailin at harvard.edu. But it should retain that plus flower so that I can do very effective fam spil uh, filtration. Uh, this is, uh, perhaps off the record, a nice trick when you need to sign up for multiple accounts with some site that doesn't really want you to be able to do this, because you can sign up with an infinite number of addresses, all of which end up at yours. So that's perhaps the first way I tripped over this bug in a website. But uh, we'll leave that uh, as uh, uh, a question mark. Let me take one moment to introduce two of our other teaching fellows here, um, Peter and Alex. If you guys wouldn't mind coming up for a second and giving a fantastic 20-second uh, speech. Sure. Hello. I'm, I'm Peter Lifland. I'm one of the TF's ITF CS50 uh, Harvard course, Harvard Computer Science course last fall. Um, I've built several websites. It's fun. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Alex? Hello. Uh, my name is Alex Chang. I am a junior at Harvard. and um, I also was a TF for um, Computer Science 50 Intro to Computer Sciences, and now returning for TF for this class. And has the sweatshirt to prove it there. So there's clearly a pattern in our recruiting this semester. So thank you guys both very much. Um, so you'll see these guys more and more over the course of office hours and sections and the like. Any questions just yet? Yeah. Is there a big difference between ASP and PHP? Same in spirit, I would say. So ASP is very similar. The tag syntax is a little different. You're writing in VB script as opposed to PHP. But it's very similar in spirit. And I would say it's sort of Microsoft's answer to this kind of development that's better than CGI, but more on par with something like PHP. Yep. Good question. Other questions? All right, let's go ahead and take a five minute break. And when we come back, we'll look at some examples we've pre prepared so that we can do things right and stop just playing with little files. OK, welcome back. So let's now do this more properly. So we were really just playing around a moment ago with register.php. And all this file was spitting out was just a simple bit of text. So it wasn't spitting out HTML, certainly not valid HTML or XHTML. So let's just let's start to clean this up and then actually solve a problem, one involving authentication, in fact. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. Just because it's not possible for me to generally remember how to type something like this out, and it's a little boring to type all of this stuff out, I'm going to just bootstrap ourselves by making a copy of of my HTML page. I'm just going to call it register2.php, the second version of this file. Now, I, well, apparently that already exists, but that is, OK, register2. OK, now I'm going to go ahead and open register2.php, which for the moment is identical. But now I'm going to go ahead and now rip out everything in the body, because I actually want to now make use of PHP in this file and spit out some dynamic content. So we saw something similar in spirit to this last week, where we actually responded to the Google query just by, just by printing out uh, some resulting text. But suppose, very simply, I want to have a confirmation of this person's registration. So no database yet. I just want to actually spit out these fields. So I'm going to do something like the following. So in bold, I'm going to spit out the person's name in a moment. Then I'm going to have a nice little line break. Then I'm going to say, are they a captain? And I'm going to put that after the bold facing as well. Uh, after that, I'm going to have two other fields. Uh, let's see, one other field for now. No, two other fields. So gender, and we'll leave that after the bold facing. And then finally, their dorm, and after that, a colon. All right, so we will now be able to do the following. Let me open up froshims.html. 
I'm going to go ahead and insert the number two here, just so it submits to the right page. And just to now confirm that this is going to the right place, let me go ahead and type in David, it will be a captain, mail, and Matthews, and register. And all we should see now is this template. All right, so let's actually do something with it. So now at least, though, if I view the source, notice that I'm at least spitting out valid XHTML. So here we finally see the utility of using PHP to dy gen dynamically generate some resulting page. All right, so let's fill in these blanks. I'm going to go back to register2.php, and these files we'll put online after class for reference. And let me go ahead and spit out the name. So based on the very simple building blocks we've been playing with thus far, how do I go, out, go about spitting out the person's name who's just registered? Yeah, so we need a couple of these tags. So here comes some PHP, because I now need some logical code, not just some aesthetic markup. And we've seen the print function. Echo is another popular function, pretty much equivalent. I'll use print just for now to be more consistent with other languages you might have seen. And now I want to print out, let's see, dollar sign underscore post bracket name semicolon, and then close bracket. And let's see if this is enough. Let's go back, reload. I'm not going to even bother going back to the form. I'll just let the browser resubmit the same form via post. That's why we get this warning, because you're resubmitting a post request, not a get. And OK, so now we're beginning to fill in the blanks. Now I threw away all of the validation, so now we're just focusing on the aesthetics and integrating this into a page. So here, I could do something similar. So I can print out the value of dollar sign underscore post captain. And then let's see what value I get here. All right, so reload, enter. All right, so that's kind of stupid, right? So let's actually use a bit of logic. Well, we can do this in PHP. Just to be a little neat, I'm going to go ahead and hit enter, because white space in XHTML doesn't matter. It's just going to uh, normalize to one space. So I want to do something conditionally here. So let me actually get rid of all this. And I'm just going to encapsulate it in these two quotes. But again, this is really just for aesthetic reasons. What do I want to do? Well, if. Let's say post dollar sign, uh, whoops, captain. For now, let's just say equals equals on. What would you have me display? OK, yes. All right, else, and hopefully you're finding, wow, PHP, really not so hard after whatever other language I'm coming from. It's syntactically identical to something like C, C++, or the like, albeit with some dollar signs and such. Let's see if this now gets us a little closer. Well, let's go ahead and reload, enter. OK, so now we've got now a bit of logic. And you can do fancier things. And um, we could do uh, the ternary operator using question mark and colon, if you've seen that kind of thing before. But the point is, now we've integrated a bit of logic into our page. Now realize, too, this is arguably not the best of paths we're going down, because if you've been taught that separation of content and uh, of rather data and presentation is ideal. There are other ways we could do this, but for now we're just playing around with some of the features of this language. So we'll leave this alone for the moment. Gender, that's OK. I'm going to go ahead and just echo that out with print uh, dollar sign underscore post name. And incidentally, PHP, unlike something like C, is fairly loose when it comes to single quotes and double quotes. This is just as fine. You do not have to restrict single quotes use to individual characters, as you might in C. But there is a difference between single quotes and double quotes. What is that difference generally in a language or current popular languages? Yeah, the value. OK, so again, we, I'll, I'll aggregate all your answers. So. Uh, Expressions in between double quotes are actually interpolated, which means if you've got a variable inside of double quotes, that variable will be converted to its value. But if you have single quotes, it will still look like dollar sign variable name, which is probably not what you generally want. All right, so for here, it doesn't matter. But I'm a little anal and just tend to be consistent and just use double quotes there. Let's see if this prints out now the person's gender. Hmm. Bad. OK. Gender. It's a good bug. A little funny. OK, and now we have dorm. All right, so let's deal with dorm. And it's a little interesting because we can introduce one other PHP construct that's certainly familiar from other languages. Well, if I have just one dorm selected, I can certainly just print out post, I think it's called dorm, that, reload. Hmm, interesting, array. Now, I only selected one, but why is it still coming back apparently as an array? Right, still an array. 
because of the name I gave it. So remember, in the、H、XHTML form, I said this is called dorm open bracket close bracket, which is a hint to PHP treat this field as an array. And whatever it contains, convert that into an array, even if there's just one value. So I apparently need to. Probably not print array, but iterate over this thing. Well, there's a number of ways we can do this, but it's pretty easy to use the for each construct. So let me go ahead and do this. I'm going to follow the pattern of before, and I'm going to do this. So for each、uh, underscore post dorm, so I'm specifying the name of the array as. Dorm. So this induces a loop over all of the elements in that array, and on each iteration, calls the current one dollar sign dorm. What do I want to do? I want to go ahead and print out what? Yeah. So dollar sign dorm, and yeah. So maybe a list, or I'm going to be a little lazy. How about dollar sign dorm followed by a line break for now? It's not pretty, but at least it will get things done. Even though it's still going to look a bit ugly because of my lack of. Any indentation below it, but let's see what happens here. So now let's reload. Okay, Matthews, that one looks okay, but we can very quickly、uh, violate the aesthetics of this page by doing something like this. It's not the prettiest, but at least we're now iterating over the content. So I wanted to introduce some of these sort of little baby examples because now we'll transition to something that's a little more sophisticated. Not much code, but you'll at least have had a taste now of some of these basic building blocks, which frankly are relatively easy to pick up once you have seen. I would say just a few. So let's take a look at this. In ton among tonight's examples and among tonight's printouts are the files in this login directory. So you will see the following convention used on our course's website. So .php files, as you would expect, actually get executed. So if you click on home.php, you will see whatever the result is of the web server processing that file and spitting out the output. Well, that's great if you want to see what the program does. Not so great if you're a student or staff and actually want to see what the file is. Now, in general, on a web server. Probably you don't want your users seeing what the file is because you presumably have some claim to intellectual property there. But a convention, so that you know, is that if a file ends in .phps for source, that means it is in fact viewable. For us, that's useful, especially since we can do some nice, pretty printing features. So this is the textual version of the file that, if you click on the original .php. Actually, gets executed. So it's just sort of a useful tool to bear in mind. We have a whole bunch of versions of a login mechanism. Only a few of which we'll take a look at tonight because we're going to stop short of using an actual database where some of this information ultimately belongs. But let's take a look. Consider the following problem: You've got a website. You want to password protect not only your main page but presumably every other page in your site, much like we do with the courses website for some of the content. So, based on tonight's snippets alone, what is one? Feature perhaps of PHP that you could leverage in order to ensure that every one of your pages is somehow password protected. So you could call a function at the top of every page. Absolutely. What else could you do?、Uh, so you could use an HT access, but that would be a non-PHP solution. Let's focus now just on the code, but that too would work. So you could use some kind of global variable, and in fact, we'll come. We'll answer that by way of、um, the session, as it's called, another super global tonight. You could also just require or include the same file at the top of every page, and in that file could be some kind of check: Is the user logged in? If so, do nothing. If not, redirect them to say login.php or something like that. All right. So let's take a look at exactly this. This is home.php, and as the boldface text implies. Our states, you are not logged in. So let's make this page actually stateful, so that I can proceed to log in, say by way of version one of this program here, and that page home.php will then remember that I logged in at this other file altogether. So this other file altogether is login one. .php. It's a very simple form, and I think the username and password that exists, J Harvard, and the password of Crimson, will in fact let me stay logged in now. So notice. Um, the website is telling me I'm logged in, even though this is a different file altogether. This is home.php. So somehow there's some kind of stateful communication between the two, and the answer to that, as we'll see, will be in this thing called the session. But first, the code. So let's take a look at the page. If I take a look just at the source code of this thing. By way of my browser, it's just a very simple form, and it's apparently submitting to login one dot php. It's using post, probably for what reason? Right, 
Yes, so the password, right? If it goes in the URL, it's kind of easy for anyone who sits down at the computer next to just grab it from the history of the browser. Generally, not a good thing. And so we just use post so that it gets slightly hidden. And we also specify that this field is of type password, which doesn't do any kind of fancy crypto. It simply turns the symbols into bullets just from prying human eyes. That's all it does.、Um, in fact, when I actually hit submit, is this form secure given its use of type equals password? No, because I mean, the URL never actually changed to HTTPS, which is another solution we can ultimately throw at this problem. All right, so now this form submits to login1.php. That is, this form submits to itself. So there's a couple of different paradigms we'll, we'll show in the course.、Um, for simplicity, I think it's often easiest for one page to submit to another, because then the logic flow is very simple. Login goes to login1.php, login maybe submits to login2.php, and maybe if there's an error, you bounce the user back to login. 1.php. But you run into some headaches with that. For instance, it's a very common goal. If you screw up while filling out a form or typing in your username and password, it's kind of nice if the website does what for you besides telling you that you messed up? Highlights the fields or retains information, right? Even just today, I was at 1800flowers.com and I clicked a link. I filled out,、uh, I had just typed in actually all my credit card information. I clicked another link thinking, OK, it will remember that while I go type in my billing address in the other screen. Sure enough, I come back to the other page and they've just thrown away all my information because of a little lazy coding or maybe a security concern because they didn't want to remember. The say, credit card number in the HTML that's being cached locally. But、uh, nonetheless, it simply wasn't retained. So that's one of the problems you run into if you take one page and submit to another, because if there's an error, where do you need to send the user back to? This one, but then you somehow have to pass all that same information back, and you'll see that this is not as simple as might be ideal. So a common paradigm is to simply submit. To the same file. So login1.php, we'll see, actually has the form submit to itself, which means at the top of this file, we essentially need some kind of conditional check. If you were submitted to, process the login. Else, do what? Just show the form. So it's sort of nicely self contained. So in fact, if I scroll down past all of this code up top, You do, in fact, see the XHTML at the bottom, which is ultimately what is spit out by default. So, again, if you'd like to follow along on your printouts, this should be under login1.php. There's not all that much to it. Notice the following features. So, up top here, I didn't want to bother introducing SQL and all of this all at once, so I just hard coded a username and password. So, PHP supports what are called constants. By convention, people typically write these in all capital letters, as you may know.、Um, one means via which you can define a constant is with the define function. You give it two arguments, the name of the constant and its value, and henceforth, that constant exists with,、uh, throughout the file. So, I decided for simplicity, there's only going to be one user, one password, J Harvard and Crimson. So, what do I next do in this file? Well, this is the top of the file. And as we said last week, PHP files are interpreted top to bottom, left to right. So, one of the first things that happens here is yes, we define those two constants, but the next thing we want to check before we show any XHTML is did the user just submit a form to this page or Are they here for the first time? In which case, they should just see everything else. So, we do this check. And there's a number of ways to do this, but one way is with this code here. So, if the following variable is set, so is set, one word, post、uh, of user, and it's the case that post pass is also set, the implication is what? Just to be clear. Yeah, so the implication is that form was submitted because if the user just pulled up this URL and hit enter, they wouldn't have submitted anything. So you can infer from the presence or absence of HTTP parameters how the user got here. So now, of course, someone could have bookmarked something with a username and password field in the URL, but unlikely, and even then, Who cares? Because fine, we'll try to authenticate them anyway. But in short, one way of determining how the user got here was just to check for the presence or absence of certain parameters, specifically ones you know should exist if a form was submitted. All right, but that's not good enough just to check if those values are set. We also want to check if they're actually what they should be. So in this next line, we just do a comparison, very similar to the quick and dirty examples we whipped up before break. If the username equals user and the password equals equals pass, Then go ahead and do what? Well, somehow conceptually, we want to remember that the user is logged in. Yeah? Well, I just want to know if the user, are blanks true for set or not? 
Uh, good question. So yes, if a variable is equal to the empty string, quote unquote, that is set. So um, there's very nice large truth tables in PHP that will tell you exactly what uh, the equivalences are among null, empty string, set, and unset. Um, but empty string is set. Yes? Correct. So in this case, it wouldn't, because I'm only looking at post, in which case neither of those variables would be set, in which case we'd fall all the way through to the XHTML. So the, another sort of suggestion that you shouldn't, it's best to not use request, but choose specifically, just because you'll have a little more control over the behavior of your code. But an excellent point. OK, so the hanging question was, how do you quote unquote remember that the user is logged in? Well, what's really nice about PHP and really any of these server side web languages is that you generally have the ability to retain state even though HTTP itself is stateless. In other words, um, back in the day when you'd visit a web page, and even now in some browsers, you hit enter and the little globe or whatever spins in the top corner saying it's thinking, it's fetching, and then the page would come back, the globe stops spinning. And what that means is literally the connection between browser and server is closed. It ends as soon as all of the content has been downloaded. So in that sense, is HTTP stateless. You're not constantly staying in touch with the server like you are with SSH or with other protocols. Rather, that's it for the connection. So this is problematic if the web server wants to remember who you are on each subsequent request. And this is common if you visit Facebook. right? You don't want to have to type in your username and password every time you follow a link. It'd be nice if Facebook remembers that about you. Same for banking websites, even your preferences on CNN.com. What, what edition of the news do you want? So somehow or other, a site's got to be able to Remember who you are, even though you might take five minutes before visiting the next page, even though you might take your laptop halfway across campus and as a result get a new what? IP address, right? So it might be nice to think, well, let's just map you, let's just remember users by way of their IP address. But if any of you who have roommates or family at home and have some kind of home router, well, there could be two, three, five of you online on the internet at once. All of you have the same IP address. And odds are you don't want your roommates or your family seeing the very same pages and getting the very same access that you do. And certainly in general, if you're at, say, a Starbucks or in a hotel who's similarly sharing IP addresses among many users, not as reliable assumption to make that one IP equals one user. So websites plant what instead on your computers? Yeah, so cookies. So what is a cookie? It's a file. Yeah, it's just good. So it's just a file that is stored locally on your own hard drive in some folder that Microsoft or Mozilla or whomever decided this is where cookies will go. Or they can be stored temporarily in RAM, and those are called session cookies, and they're much uh, shorter lived. And inside that cookie can be, for the most part, anything the web server wants to put there. If it's kind of a stupid implementation, it might put your username and password in the cookie so that you are kind of authenticating every time against the server. But the obvious downside of this is that you're storing a username and password on the user's computer, and that's bad because. Right, it might not be their computer per se. They might, you know, it might be a shared computer, and just it's not good practice to have these passwords just lying around in the clear. If we've all been taught memorize them, don't write them down. Well, you don't want every website effectively writing them down for you. So instead, as we'll see, a web server typically stores not your original credentials or even the information that you're tr it's trying to remember about you, but rather it just plants one really big and really random number. And then it remembers in its own database that this really big number, this 10-digit number, 20-digit number, maps to a whole bunch of information on the server side. So if you go to a website like Facebook and you've got a whole bunch of preferences, it remembers if your chat window is up or down these days, it remembers who you're logged in as. All of these details that you could imagine storing in a cookie client side can all be stored in a database server side or in a big file server side. And all your browser has to do every time it requests a page from Facebook or bankofamerica.com or wherever is just remind the web server, here's my big random number, here's my big random number, here's my big random number. And in fact, just like there's all those other cryptic looking HTTP headers that go across the wire when you make a request that we saw last week, cookies go across the wire as well. Cookie, colon, space, big random number is exactly what's being sent, perhaps unbeknownst to you, every time you visit a website that's planted 
a cookie on your computer. It sends back the cookie every time. So performance too. You don't really want to store big globs of data on the browser because you're just wasting your own bandwidth, having them sent back and forth automatically. So why is this useful? Well, this is useful because it allows you, the developer, just to assume that you have the ability to store any amount of information about the current user by way of a super global called dollar sign underscore session. So this global is sort of automatically created for you by PHP, and it sort of trans it transparently to you figures out what cookie was just sent to the server, who that cookie maps to, and then it grabs from its own database, PHP, or really the web server, it grabs from its own database all of the information that you, the programmer, put there previously, puts it back in the super global so that now you can have access to that same information. Well, fortunately for remembering that a user is logged in, it's pretty trivial, right? I can do that with one bit. Are they logged in? Yes. Or are they not logged in? No. True or false. And so I fairly arbitrarily decided that I will remember that the current user is logged in just by setting a variable in this super global, a key in this super global, whose value is the Boolean value true. And that's enough, because I can now trust that PHP, the next time this user visits me, will grab that, super, uh, that um, session object, so to speak, all the variables I've tucked away in this object. It will grab them back from its database or disk, put them back in this super global for me, and voila, I can now check the value of that variable as well. And so how does home.php know if I'm logged in or not? Remember that home.php did this thing here? What do you think home.php does in its code? Yeah, it looks at that value. So let me scroll down here. It's mostly XHTML, but aha. If session, quote unquote, authenticated, right? It's just assuming if this is true, print you are logged in, else print you are not logged in. And so you can have this intercommunication, this maintenance of state across pages just by using as sort of the middleman this session object. All right, well, let's take a look back here now at the code. So what else am I doing? What's going on after I remember that the user is logged in? It's kind of a mess. And unfortunately, this is one of those things you learn by reading the manual and henceforth copy and paste forever. Comment kind of answers what this is doing. Well, it looks like it's redirecting the user to home page using absolute path per those directions there. So that's all it's doing. So people, you will very often see, even in open source libraries, that people will very often just do this to redirect a user. And I think I alluded to this last week. Well, you send an HTTP header. That's the location header. And then you say, eh, go to home.php. Technically, this is not correct. And some browsers, even though there's decreasingly many, will not respect this properly. So it looks like a relative URL, but it's not proper. The spec says it should be a fully qualified URL, which is why these three lines of code, copying and pasted from PHPNet, essentially use some trickery to figure out what the current host is, what the domain name is, what the current path is, the directory name, and then it appends to that whatever file you want to actually redirect the user to. So again, if we were sort of just teaching this the easy way, uh, we would have done what I did a second ago and just say redirect to home.php. But uh, long term, we'd be doing a bit of a disservice. So that's why we adopt from the manual those lines of code. But the point is simply that after we've authenticated the user, there's really no reason for them to stay at login1.php. I certainly don't need to show them that username and password field. Let's just send them back to the home page. And this, if you follow the steps that Facebook uses to log in, it's pretty much the same thing. If you visit Facebook, you will fill in your username, uh, your email address and password. I think you'll still, to this day, go to login.php. It will do its thing and then redirect you to home.php. And it will, though, will use a bit of uh, SSL to encrypt at least the password part of that. So what happens if, one, I don't type a username or password at all, I just pull up this page for the first time, or two, I type the wrong username and password? Exactly. You fall through all this code, because none of the if conditions evaluate to true, and so it's false, false. And so you eventually get down here. There's nothing then for PHP to do, because it's all done at that point. So this gets spit out raw. So again, this idea that PHP code can and often is commingled with XHTML is perfectly uh, exemplified here. But notice I did do one trick. Right? I at least want to tell the user if they screwed up. So let me take a look here. So if I go back to this 
and I type in not jharvard but david and some any old password, this should not be allowed through, log in. I see the same page, but I at least wanted some kind of helpful hint. I wanted to at least tell the user why they're being resent here, and I want to say invalid login. So you could do this any number of ways, but I kind of decided this was kind of a good enough way. So if the size of the post array is greater than zero, what's the implication? Submitted something was submitted, and the fact that something was submitted and I still got to this point means what? Well, something was wrong, and so it's kind of a safe assumption to say, well, there was an error. So again, maybe for more sophisticated pages, it's too simplistic, but again, it gets the job done. And you can imagine doing other things still. You could set a Boolean value that's er the dollar sign error equals true, and you can check that variable. There's any number of ways we could do this. But let's take things up a notch now. Let's take a look now at uh, login2.php which does things a little bit differently. So in login2.php, I decided let's actually not tick off the user by not pre-populating the field, as in that previous case, let's at least put that value back in. In other words, if I try the same mistake, typing my own name in version 2 instead of jharvard, let's notice that my mistake at least comes back to haunt me. So David has been pre-populated. Maybe not appropriate here because it's the username that's wrong. So let's do jharvard with, again, some meaningless password that's definitely wrong. Log in. At least now I'm being helped somewhat by having the field pre-populated. So instinctively, think for a moment, how would you go about doing this? Even based on the simple building blocks we've seen thus far. Yeah, exactly. So inside the form element, just echo or print the value that's in that variable, because if it's present, it will be spit out. And if it's not, nothing will get spit out. So let's take a look. So this is login2.php. The top of it is actually identical. So it's really just the bottom part that's different. And notice, and unfortunately it wraps onto two lines, notice that for the username only, I'm saying that the value is actually, quote unquote, the result of echoing, which is pretty much synonymous with printing the field called user that's in the post array. So the effect of this is that if there's nothing there, by, the first, the, by default, the first time you visit the page, nothing gets printed out, and that's fine. But if there is something there, then it will actually pre-populate the form. So what we actually see in the XHTML notice, if I pull up the page source and zoom in, notice that in fact, value equals quote unquote J Harvard was spit out there. Now why didn't I do this with just to toss the softball question out, the password field. Because it would show, right, so this way you don't see it at all. But, so it's probably not much help to the user if it's all there as bullet signs anyway. But if you do spit it out, the problem is it does end up where? So in the HTML code, in the cache as a result. So in general, even though I poke fun at 1-800-Flowers, it's kind of a good thing that they didn't pre-populate the credit card field after I migrated, uh, navigated away from the page, because then it would have been in the cache, and someone with too much free time could, in fact, find it there locally on the hard drive if they started fishing around. So same idea here. All right, well, let's see what else we can do that's a little fancier still. So in login 3, notice that. It does the following. So it looks like, oh, interesting. It looks like this one is actually setting a cookie explicitly. So it's worth scrolling back for just a moment. There's one line of code that we didn't mention that has been in examples one, two, and three, and that's this line here. So anytime you want to use sessions, that is, you want to maintain state across multiple files, you have to, have to, have to call the session start function once at the top of every one of those pages. You can either hard code it, as I've done here, or you could put it in some factored out file called header.php and just require that same file again and again. Really depends on your design, but it has to be there. Otherwise, PHP will not spit out that big random number for your computer, and it will lose track of who you are. So that's why it needs to be there. But notice what else we can do here. So if I scroll down, notice that I've added this line of code. And again, PHP is kind of nice because the functions typically are so long they tell you what they're doing. In this case, set cookie is obviously setting a cookie. The name of this cookie apparently is user. The value of this cookie is 
you know, what they typed in, because it's coming from post. And then it looks like I'm calling the time function, uh, which returns the number of seconds since January 1, 1970, and adds to it what? A week. Right? So what I decided to do, just because it's a nice friendly feature, is not only did I want to remember the username if the user screws up on trying to log in, much like Facebook and these other sites, I'd also like to give them the convenience of remembering their username in perpetuity, at least, or seven days, whichever is shorter. So in this case, we simply are pre-populating the fields using this cookie value, but how? Well, I'm storing this cookie. I'm not just storing that big random number on their computer. I'm now explicitly storing a username. And you can sort of decide for yourself if you like or dislike this. But I decided this was a reasonable violation of privacy, just to tuck it away in the local cookie file. Because now, down here, I can make use of this other super global. So it's a little messy in that it's wrapping on multiple lines. But right here, we see the username field. It's an input name equals user. The type is text. And the value is, and here I just want to get a little fancier using my ternary operator, I'm echoing either of the post quote unquote user field or what else? Or the cookie. So here's another super global from last week's list. Dollar sign underscore cookie is all of the cookies that have been set by you on the user's computer using the set cookie function, though other mechanisms are possible. And what I'm simply asking here is if post quote unquote username has been set, which one of these two do I spit out? spit out the most you recently entered one, because presumably that should override perhaps the stale version. Otherwise, if nothing was in post user, let's go ahead and just spit out the cookie for now, which will expire on its own within seven days. And here's the distinction now between set cookie and session cookies. Um, the cookie that is automatically sent back and forth as a result of this function call here is, as the name suggests, a session cookie. It lives or should live only in RAM in the user's browser. So that big random number, in theory, lives just in RAM and goes away as soon as you quit the browser or close that particular window. Calling set cookie with a time that is non-zero, so zero means session cookie. Keep it in RAM. Anything non-zero and positive means store in a file because it needs to persist. So that's one distinction as well. Maybe not a perfectly safe assumption, but you should know that if you start saying, let this live for multiple days, it's going to get stored in a file and thus persist. Yeah? Uh, what happens if you leave out the exit? Uh, the exit. Ah, excellent. So I didn't mention earlier that I had this little exit call here. So if I didn't have that, what would happen is the HTTP header, location, colon, whatever, would still get spit out. But then so would all of this HTML pay, all of this HTML. So these days, that's not so bad, because almost all browsers do respect the HTTP spec, and therefore when they see the location colon header, they bounce the user to that address. A downside, though, of omitting the exit is that I'm wasting all these bytes and time spitting out content that the user is never going to see or is going to see for a split second. Um, worse, perhaps, is that if the browser for some reason doesn't respect this header, they're going to see a page that they really shouldn't. So this is why back in the day, you would see not only code spitting out this location header for the redirect, but also a very simple page that says something like, if you are not redirected within three seconds, click this link. That's not the only reason people spit that out, but that was one of them. You would get some default HTML with a link plus the header, and you would hope that both one or both work. Good question. Other questions? All right, let's take things up slightly further into this. Uh, yes? Um, cookie names. Cookie names, okay. You do. So who controls cookies? You get to decide what the name of a cookie is that you are planting on the user's computer. But they are maintained on a per domain basis, so you won't get name collisions with other cookies unless you yourself create the same cookie twice. Yeah? Good question. What if the browser doesn't support cookies? Lots of things start breaking, frankly. Um, so PHP and in turn web servers these days are pretty good at trying to work around that problem. And what you'll often see if a browser, if a web server detects that cookies are not being set properly, what it will start doing is appending to the URL strings, if possible, the really long random number. So in fact, the extension school's website um, 
kind of does this. They use a Java-based setup, I believe. And what, if you poke around the Extension School site long enough, it, and eventually you'll probably get a URL that has question mark j sesh id equals such and such. And that's because whatever serv application server they're using, for whatever reason, is spitting that out in the URL. Um, and that's really a workaround. So it means the data is still getting passed in, but not via the super global cookie, so to speak, but rather by, via the get string itself. So it's sort of a last course method. And if that just doesn't work, it just the site doesn't work. So people who are turning off cookies and frankly turning off JavaScript these days are closing more and more doors to themselves. So it's, it's a design decision that you have to make. Is that an acceptable risk? Other questions? All right, so login four. So in login four, which again you have a printout of, we do one bad thing here which is that we not only store the username, but also, we're also the password in a cookie. And your second, perhaps uh, easier uh, unofficial homework assignment for next two weeks from now will be in your own choice of browsers. Go ahead and play with this demo, because it'll stay on the course's website, login for, log yourself in as J Harvard and Crimson, and then go find within your browser's cache files where the cookie is that was planted. And probably it's in like, C colon backslash windows backslash documents and settings or something like that. Poke around or Google around for where Firefox stores it. But you'll actually see these cookies. And if you're storing strings like J Harvard and Crimson, it'll be very easy to identify in those files. So if only just to reassure yourself that uh, what we're preaching here is, in fact, technically accurate. But we are doing this in this example. So it's, again, it's a bit hard to see all at once on the screen in this font size. But notice I have the same block of code up top. If this, uh, or rather, slightly different up top, rather than check post first, I decided, you know what, I want to authenticate the user again and again first based on the cookie value. So I'm doing in this example exactly what we advised a moment ago was not such a good idea, but we can demonstrate how it works. We simply check if the cookie user and the pass cook, or if the user cookie and the pass cookie are both set, and they both happen to equal J Harvard and Crimson. Go ahead and authenticate the user just as before, and in fact, refresh the cookie, in other, uh, so to speak, so that it lives another seven days from now. Buy the user a seven day extension on um, the cookie that's been stored on their computer. So again, this is merely for demonstrative purposes, not for recommend recommended purposes. But the rest of the file then is the same, except for a uh, remembering of the cookie. OK, questions on? Co yeah. Ah, good question. So when it, uh, if they say, remember my password, odds are they're not quite remembering your password. Instead, they are planting a really big random number on your, uh, in a cookie that they are also remembering in their database. So the next time they see that cookie, they say, oh, uh, it, your cookie is 12345. If they then check their database and say, oh, here's cookie 12345, I'm going to assume it's this guy's, then they start treating you as though you're logged in. So there's this notion, we'll come back to this in our security lectures of session hijacking. The implication of these big random numbers is absolutely that there is a non-zero chance that your login information, or rather your session, could be hijacked by someone else. If you have someone in Starbucks sitting between you and Facebook, or you and whatever, any non-SSL encrypted website, anyone could sniff these HTTP headers, like we've been doing with uh, the Firefox plugin, if they've got Wireshark or Ethereal, any of these uh, packet sniffing software tools, you could see the cookie colon big random number going back and forth across the wire. It's not hard for you, the adversary, then to start sending that cookie to Facebook. And you can literally log yourself into their account by having stolen that cookie. Now, this is very unlikely to happen by chance, but it's possible but it's more likely to happen by some adversarial effect. And so this is why SSL is actually incredibly important if you really want to minimize that risk. And it's why absolutely really important websites like banks and PayPal and the like use SSL. Because the cost of someone stealing your money is presumably much higher than stealing your profile. So a perfect segue, in fact, to some of uh, stuffs tonight. But let me make mention of one thing first. So PHP 5, the latest version of PHP, which has now been around for a while, does support um, object-oriented programming. So you will see in a lot of open source software that a lot of the earliest stuff out there, also stuff that's meant to be backwards compatible, is not written with classes and objects and any of this in mind. 
But it does exist. And over the course of the term, we'll peel back some more layers on the courses library, that course.php file that I showed you. You might have glimpsed briefly, it actually implements a course class, just because I at least am a fan of trying to encapsulate things and hide as many details as possible. So know that this feature exists. Although, at least with the initial projects, you'll find that much of the projects are perhaps best. Uh, can certainly be done procedurally without any form of object orientation, but know that that feature exists. Um, cookies was meant to set up our cookie discussion, but we got ahead of ourselves there. Sessions, this is to hint uh, at the idea of a shopping cart, which is, as you might now infer, the means by which shopping carts are generally implemented. You need to remember state across page clicks and adding to cart, so session objects are used for that too. Authentication we took a look at as well. And I thought I would mention now this as our segue to our last topic today, SSL. So not only did we, we use that SSL file, uh, sorry, we used that HT access file last week to sort of um, normalize the domain names that user res users were visiting, mostly for branding reasons. Though there's also some security reasons you might have this as well. I added a snippet this time that says the following. If the request URI begins with whatever the domain is, slash login, slash, uh, and HTTPS is not on, what is the third line of code on the bottom there telling the browser to do? Re rewrite or redirecting them to HTTPS. So these three lines of code at the bottom of the slide, which now supplement the two above, or the three above that we saw last week, are now saying any time the user tries to visit any files in the slash login slash directory, bounce them back to SSL. So this is perhaps the simplest and most effective way of just SSL protecting various directories on your website, assuming the server supports SSL in the first place, because you are telling Apache, the web server, make sure that any time they try to dive in this directory, they are not allowed to go through, but rather they're bounced back to the SSL version of this page. Now, once you get there, or to that, um, once you get to that URL, there's got to be a web server running. And that means a couple things need to happen. One, by default, SSL-based websites run not on port 80, but on port 443. So by convention, 443 must also be accessible, which means in your main http.conf file, there's got to be some mention somewhere of the web server listening not only on port 80, but also on port 443, unless you've changed it to be something else. Um, you all, the web server also has to know what key file, what certificate to use. So long story short, and this is not something we'll ask that you get or buy for the course because, again, um, we would need 156 IP addresses, which we do not have. We have four, um, which is plenty for virtual hosting, not enough for SSL-based websites. But you would need to go to someplace like VeriSign or GoDaddy or any number of other websites, which will charge a ridiculous difference, uh, differences in amounts. Um, GoDaddy, frankly, is $29.95. And certainly for the websites I've ever needed SSL protection on, it's always worked fine. You go to VeriSign uh, or the likes, you'll pay $50, $100, $200, $500. You'll pay for the right to put their stupid little logo on your website to tell the world, we are hacker safe, which is kind of a farce. It's just a marketing thing. But just realize that there are differences. Now, the downside of going with someone like uh, the cheap ones from GoDaddy is that there is a chance that there will be browsers out there that don't recognize GoDaddy certificates because they haven't made the right partnerships in life. And so the users will get some kind of error. So that's what you're paying to avoid. You're um, risk averse, pay for the more expensive ones. If it's for a real corporate website that really matters and isn't just a course in a sandbox, um, go ahead and try saving some money there. But you'll get, when you sign up for an SSL certificate, a couple of files. One is a private key file, which is some, uh, something you need for the cryptography involved in SSL. And you'll also get a certificate that is quote unquote signed by GoDaddy or in turn someone else like VeriSign. That certificate needs to be installed in your web server. And how you do this depends on the software you're running and the version of the software and such. But it ultimately boils down to uploading a few text files to your web server that are only like a kilobyte or two large. They're very small files. You then tell the web server where to look for those files. And then any time a browser visits https colon slash slash yourdomain.com, what first happens between browser and server is one asks the other, give me your certificate. And the other says, give me the same. 
name. And they use these two certificates in a nice mathematical way to come up with a shared secret, a really big secret number that they then use subsequently to start encrypting all of the traffic between them, including the HTTP headers. And that, if we had exams in this class, would be a good exam question. Why must you have a unique IP address for uh, SSL to work with virtual hosting? Well, you need to know what website the request belongs to, but you can't know that until you decrypt it. But if every website has its own decryption key, you don't know what key to use to decrypt the request. So it's one of those catch-22s. So in short, for now, um, perhaps for lack of foresight, the location field remains encrypted in SSL transactions, and so you need a unique IP address for this to work. But once you have it, the transactions between server and client are in fact encrypted and in theory secure. And what you need to do in your config file, in Apache at least, is something pretty simple. And I say simple, but frankly, if you ever have to do this, it's a huge headache because it's never as easy as it should be. And unfortunately, you have to do it every damn time the certificate expires. Um, for instance, last week when you couldn't get into the home page because our SSL cert had expired. But you essentially configure three lines like that. And I'll refer you to uh, some very helpful tutorials that exist on the web and via Google. So where are you going to start using all of this information? Well, it's not going to be distributed until the next lecture, because we're going to lay some of the foundations in terms of PHP support for XML. But the first project, again, if you're familiar, is going to hand you literally a PDF of three aces menu, which is a little joint down the road that sells pizza and subs. And it will be your task to figure out a schema, a database design, albeit an XML, for this menu, so that you can represent the different subs and the different sizes, the different pizzas, the different toppings, and actually represent this in human readable fashion so that a user, say the owner of that pizza shop, can have people visit his website on the internet and actually add items to a shopping cart, check out, get an email confirmation. And so we'll see not only in uh, two weeks from now, but also we'll draw on some of the elements from last week in this exactly how you can begin to piece websites like this together. Um, but with that said, why don't we adjourn for tonight? Section will take place across the hall and we'll see you in a couple weeks.